Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sanket Pisat and in today's video we are going to be looking at uterine artery ligation at the origin for broad ligament fibroid. This particular technique has become very popular in recent times uh, because of the advent of retroperitoneal dissection. But we are going to be looking at exact technique of performing this surgery and in which situations it is clinically indicated. Now, uh, I'd like to say that a lot of people have been emphasizing retroperitoneal dissection uh, and it is definitely an art that one must master. However, the use of this art must be in selected circumstances and definitely not at the earlier part of your learning curve. Uh, if I'd like those of you who have not yet joined to visit the website www.endogynetraining.com to join our WhatsApp discussion group where we discuss daily life problems related to gynae endoscopy and simple solutions for them. So you can, you are most welcome to join the group and take part in the discussion. This particular patient is a 50 year old lady. She has heavy menstrual bleeding. She has been given adequate medical, medical management for the past one and a half years to which she has not responded. And the ultrasound shows a large 10 centimeter right sided broad ligament fibroid, which of course is not the reason for her heavy menstrual bleeding. But since she is not responding to medical management, we've decided to go ahead with a hysterectomy. Let's take a look now at the surgical video and what are the queries that come to mind while managing this particular case. So this is the intraoperative picture and we can see that there is a large broad ligament fibroid on the right side almost completely occupying the right sided the right segment or the right pelvic wall with the uterus being deviated to the left side. Now the first problem in these scenarios is that one may not be able to always put a uterine manipulator inside. I think in this particular case we have been able to or I'm not sure because it was done quite a long time ago. But nevertheless, uh, the second question that comes to mind is whether we would like to do uterine artery ligation in this case or not. So before answering that, I'd like to tell you that before you decide whether or not to do a uterine artery ligation, in any case of laparoscopic hysterectomy, it is worthwhile to spend two minutes planning the surgery. In this particular case, looking at this image, the thought that comes to my mind is, I'm going to rewind this video just a little bit, and the thought that comes to my mind is, on this particular side, when I will be performing the laparoscopic hysterectomy, I'm going to have a definite problem with reaching the uterine artery on the right hand side. And so I may do the coronal pedicles, but once I reach up to the level of the uterine artery, it may be impossible for me to coagulate or to access the uterine artery sufficient to stop the bleeding. And that is the main reason why I am planning to do a uterine artery ligation at the origin in this particular case. Remember that you can also do this case by using vasopressin and enucleating the fibroid before. Uh, now let us take a look at the relevant anatomy. So what I am holding in my left hand is the IP ligament and what is passing below it, you can see the peristalsis clearly is the ureter. So with these two structures marked out, I am just going to mark them out for you again for those of you who have probably not understood. This is the uh, IP ligament which is, uh, which is being shown here and that is the ureter below it. So let me just pause this and show you. Uh, this is the IP ligament over here. So this is the infundibular pelvic ligament over here. This one is the IPL and this is the ureter which is seen below it. So this anatomy has to be very clear. Uh, the, uh, the infundibular pelvic ligament is always going to be found lateral to the ureter in the pelvis and many a times we make the mistake of uh, identifying the infundibular pelvic ligament as the ureter and find uh, find quite a lot of difficulty in finding the actual ureter. So look for the structure that goes and attaches itself to the ovary from the lateral pelvic wall and that is going to be the infundibular pelvic ligament and when you look, look medial to it then there you will find the ureter. So the identification of these two structures must be clear infundibular pelvic ligament and ureter. 
At this stage, let me also tell you that there are two ways to open the retroperitoneum and to find the uterine artery. One is the lateral approach and in the lateral approach, the, the peritoneum is going to be opened like this from the round ligament down up to the infundibular pelvic ligament. So assuming that the round ligament is somewhere here, it is going to be opened here. This is called as the lateral approach. And you may also open it medial to the infundibular pelvic ligament over the peritoneum of the ureter. That means over here and then search for the uterine artery on this side. So this is called as the medial approach. So medial approach also called as the posterior approach and the lateral approach which is also called as the anterior approach. So these are the two various approaches that you have to find out the uterine artery. Incidentally, the lateral approach is also called as the oncological approach because that is how oncosurgeons open the retroperitoneum and the medial approach is also called as the endometriotic approach because that is how we uh, need to open the uh, peritoneum in case of endometriosis to deep deal with deep infiltrating endometriosis. So in this particular video, we are going to be seeing the lateral approach or the oncological approach. So uh, let us resume with the video. And you can see that the ureter is identified there. The infundibular pelvic ligament has been identified over there. And what I'm going to do now is to incise the peritoneum. So uh, the ureter is being seen clearly. My assistant comes in with the back cop. Uh, he's retracting the uh, peritoneum and you can see the clear ureter seen below it. Now this tent of peritoneum that has formed over here, I'm going to take this tent of peritoneum and I'm going to incise it. If possible, my assistant can also hold the peritoneum over there so that I find it easier to incise the peritoneum. Here there is no structure below this at all. So you can comfortably incise the peritoneum over the infundibular pelvic ligament lateral to it and open the retroperitoneum over there. So a short burst of current like uh, before uh, most of the times we use this bipolar vessel sealer and you can see how the pull causes the CO2 to go inside the planes and open up the planes for you so that all the vital structures just drop down below. So at this point do not try to prematurely look for any structure. Just try to incise the peritoneum from the infundibular pelvic ligament all the way up to the round ligament and this gives you more space. The clear areolar tissue is seen below the incision that we are making signifying that we are in the correct plane. This areolar tissue also contains blood vessels and it is a good idea not to dissect this uh, tissue, this loose areolar tissue forcefully because otherwise then again there will be bleeding. So we have reached up till the level of the round ligament. You may cut the round ligament or cut it at a later stage. That is your choice. It really does not matter uh, too much for the sake of doing uterine artery ligation. Then we come back to the pre previous incision which we had made. And this incision has to be extended further cranially. So the incision has started now from the round ligament but is now extending further cranially and we have to kind of extend the incision right up till we see the body of the psoas muscle. Uh, with a few cases, about 10 or 15 cases, you will get an idea of exactly how much to extend the incision for the sake of doing the surgery. Actually, once the ureter has been identified, so we identified the ureter on the medial leaf of the broad ligament and now we are, by cutting the broad ligament leaves open, we are trying to identify the ureter between the two leaves of the broad ligament. So this camera is being cleaned. I, this is an unedited video and hence uh, I am not uh, trying to do too much of editing uh, in order to keep the original steps of the case intact. <clears throat> So now you can see that my assistant has retracted the, uh, the peritoneum and I'm going to start incising the two, between the two leaves of the broad ligament. So this is again the same instrument, the bipolar vessel sealer. I have, uh, I'm opening up the uh, loose areolar tissue and I'm not really attempting to find the ureter at this point of time. Although I will be able to see the ureter there because the impression is so clearly seen on the posterior leaf and there approximately I think is the ureter. But I am not interested in finding the ureter right now. I am going to incise the uh, loose areolar tissue between the two between the uh, broad ligament that I have incised and I am just going to continue to do this cranially. 
uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to, going to continue to do this cordially. By as I keep incising, the structures themselves start presenting uh, uh, to you or to the operating surgeon. So you can see that on the right side, what I am able to see now probably looks like it is going to come up as an impression of the external iliac artery over here. So this is probably going to be the external iliac artery. And uh, on the medial leaf somewhere here is going to be the ureter. But we are not really interested in finding that out right now. As we proceed, I am simply dissecting the loose areolar tissue away and any small or stray bleeding that comes up has to be tackled at this stage itself because this is going to soil the field and then I am going to find it really difficult in uh, the stained areolar tissue to find all the vital organs. So notice that I am not trying to find any structure at all. I am just simply cutting and dissecting the loose areolar tissue away. Some vascular structures, some vessels, some arteries are being seen underneath but I am not going to identify or take the trouble to do anything with these vessels at present. I am just incising the loose areolar tissue from above down. Short bursts of energy are the best because they do not damage anything and always the dictum is your anatomy of this area has to be very clear. So before you coagulate anything or cut anything, you have to be sure that you are not cutting any vital structure. Now coming to that, so what exactly are the vital structures that we are able to identify at this particular stage? We can see over here that the uterine uh, or rather the the external iliac vessels are seen over here. So this is the external iliac artery <clears throat> and below this covered with fat <clears throat> is the external iliac vein. Uh, the external iliac vein is posteromedial to the external iliac artery and somewhere over here we can expect the course of the ureter. But if you try to visualize, you will understand that the external iliac artery and the external iliac vein, though they are uh, on one side, on, the, on this side and the ureter is on this side, they are not exactly at the same level. So the ureter is slightly deeper than the external iliac artery and vein and this has to be remembered while doing the dissection because you will not find the ureter at the same level. One has to go a little bit deeper to find the ureter. So now as we play the video, we are going to be uh, proceeding with the case and uh, uh, I am going to try and go back and start mobilizing or start looking at the ureter from this point on. So you can see that I have dissected this, the loose area of tissue has gone away and I am going, I am trying to dissect now parallel and lateral to the ureter. The ureter is identified by means of its peristalsis. It is also identified by the network of blood vessels that it carries along with it in the periuretric sheath. Uh, incidentally, if there is a problem and the anesthetist, I mean, if you are not able to identify the ureter, one can always ask the anesthetist to give 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams of frusimide or Lasix so that the ure ureter is stimulated to move and you are able to see the peristalsis like you are able to see in this part. So you can see clearly that the ureter is moving and my intention now is to go parallel and lateral to the ureter. Since I am reasonably sure that I will be able to find the uterine artery, I can dissect only at that particular area. But for a new person, you may just start dissecting parallel and lateral to the ureter right from the time that it has crossed over the external iliac artery and downwards so as to find the vessels if of the which is the uterine artery. So uh, I am dissecting now parallel to the ureter and lateral to it in an effort to find the first structure that crosses the pararectal space from the lateral to the medial side. So which is the pararectal space? This entire structure, entire area that you see over here is actually the pararectal space. And the pararectal space is uh, divided into the medial pararectal space and the lateral pararectal space. So this is the entire pararectal space that you see over here this entire area and uh, this this would be the lateral pararectal space this area and in this lateral pararectal space we are trying to find out the uterine artery so the uterine artery is the first vessel or the first structure that crosses the pararectal space 
from the lateral to the medial side. There is no other structure that does this. And so this is the easiest and most consistent way to identify the uterine artery. So look for a structure that crosses from the lateral to the medial side and it is lateral to the ureter and this structure would be the uterine artery. Now we all know that the uterine artery is a branch of the anterior division of the internal iliac artery. And so by back tracing the uterine artery, we should be able to find the internal iliac artery. Now the uterine artery, once you have found the uterine artery, it has got certain specific characteristics. As you will see in this video, like the other vessels in the body, the uterine artery, one would expect to find that the uterine artery is uh, red in color. But most of the times one notices that the uterine artery has got a slightly bluish hue. So you can see over here, this is the uterine artery and it has got a slightly bluish hue and this is a peculiar characteristic of the artery by which one is able to find the vessel sometimes. So look for a vessel which has got a bluish hue and is lateral to the ureter. So here I think I have found the uterine artery and I am now going to separate the ureter from the uterine artery because when I attempt to coagulate the uterine artery, I should not uh, have any energy transmitting to the ureter. At this stage, uh, the uterine artery is expected to be arising from the anterior division of the internal iliac artery. So if I may show you uh, over here, you can see that the uterine artery is supposed to be going like this and this the internal iliac artery would be here and the continuation of this would be the obliterated hypogastric artery. However, contrary to what we feel it may not always happen that the uterine artery arises exactly at a 90 degree angle to the internal iliac artery. So it may happen that it comes out as a convoluted structure and then runs anteriorly for a length along the inter anterior along the um, uh, obliterated hypogastric artery and then courses medially. So you may have two vessels running side by side also in the pelvis and that can also be the uterine artery. It does not always have to come out at a right angle uh, as we see. Of course when you dissect out the uterine artery and separate it from the areolar tissue around then finally the picture is going to be uh, one that comes out at a 90 degree angle but otherwise you it may not always come out directly as as expected it may just be at an obliquity to its uh, mother mother artery also and that variation has to be remembered so here i think i have found the uterine artery i am now trying to singulate out the uterine artery now while doing this step it is very important to remember that the superficial uterine vein lies just below the uterine artery so when you are doing this step be very careful to use a slightly curved instrument here i am using the bipolar vessel sealer which is curved and remaining over the surface of the artery i am trying to go down so I am cut, coagulating and cutting just uh, around the vessel but look at this that I am not trying to dig very deep below the vessel because the vein is going to be there and I am just trying to stay flush to the lumen of the vessel and move out all the loose areolar tissue. If at this stage you feel that your access is restricted, cut some more of the areolar tissue to, in order to gain access but do not struggle too much in this area because one false movement can induce bleeding from some vessel and then at a beginner level you will get confused and probably abandon the surgery or in a worst case scenario you may consider exploring the patient as well. So here now we see the anatomy is reasonably clearly defined now. The uterine artery is seen to be coursing medially and the uh, pulsating uterine artery as well as the obliterated hypogastric artery and the um, internal iliac anterior division from where it is originating is clearly seen. So a little more dissection is done. I'm going to just forward the video a little bit so that we are able to see. And now what I'm planning to do is I am planning to uh, choose between whether I should be coagulating the vessel or whether I should be ligating it. 
so i am just going gently underneath the uterine artery you can see i have held the uterine artery with my grasper with my bipolar grasper and i am giving a slight pull to the vessel and then using the bipolar vessel sealer to kind of tunnel under the vessel now this is very significant because holding the uterine artery is not going to do any damage to the vessel it's a very strong vessel it is the vein <coughs> that we need to worry about in this particular situation i have chosen to demonstrate ligating the uterine artery by passing a suture around the vessel but even if you cannot do that it is sufficient to do this much dissection and to coagulate the uterine artery that is also sufficient one does not have to cut the uterine artery at any point of time in order to perform uterine artery ligation that is again a misconception which some people have which is really not required so coagulating or ligating the uterine artery is enough personally i think ligating the uterine artery is better because it gives complete obliteration of the lumen and there is no lateral spread of thermal energy to the ureter uh, around it so it is more uh, better it's a better surgery to do but then it requires more dissection to be performed so now you can see i am gently keeping on tunneling under the uterine artery and my idea is to create a window below the uterine artery this window will separate the uterine vein from the uterine artery and i will be able to comfortably like it at any point of time if in doubt keep checking the location of the ureter here you can see that the location of the ureter is clearly seen and you have the particular phenomenon of water under the bridge which we always talk about so the ureter is the water and the uterine artery is the bridge and you are able to see that the ureter is comfortably passing underneath the uterine artery which is the anatomy that we are expecting now at this stage if you wish to see further course of the ureter that is not possible unless and until the, the you do what is called as cutting of the uterine artery and reflecting it laterally but at present we are not going to do that in fact i have not even dissected the ureter up till the level of the uterine artery to show you the water into the bridge but at present it is not required because i have got a good length of pedicle uh, to uh, tackle for doing the uterine artery ligation so let's move on then with the video and if we see over here i'll just rewind the video a little bit because that went too fast now i have now developed the window underneath the uterine artery and i'm going to use a curved instrument to pass a suture through this window so i have identified the ureter i have identified the uterine artery and now the suture is going to be passed underneath the uterine artery uh the the maryland bipolar grasper comes in you can use any instrument that you want again notice that the that the bipolar forceps which is active now has got the ureter under it so i am reasonably sure confirming again and again it is never too uh, you can never be too careful with this particular area and you can keep confirming that it is not the ureter that you are ligating so here i can clearly see that the ureter with its peristalsis is under the vessel over here and uh, this is the ureter for those of you who may still be uh, confused as to where the location of the ureter is this is the location of the ureter and this is the uterine artery so you can clearly see over here what we are calling as the water which is passing under the bridge over here so uh, this is the ureter this is the location of the ureter and this is the uterine artery which we plan to tackle now uh, we have to pass this suture underneath the uterine artery you can see that my curved instrument is passing under the uterine artery and it may be a good idea to keep a maryland grasper at this stage or one also gets right angled graspers at least indian companies definitely make them and these right angled graspers can be passed comfortably underneath the uterine artery and you can pull the uh, pull the suture from underneath without struggle so even this much of struggle that is happening will be avoided and you will easily be able to hook the vessel and pass the suture from under it much the same way as you would use a mixer during a, a uterine artery ligation or an internal iliac ligation for a pph incidentally the only other branch that is going to be given out after this so if i were to mark it for you the first branch that that this is going to give out is the uterine artery over here and then this is going to continue as the obliterated hypogastric artery and there is only one more significant vessel which is going to be given off later that is the superior vesical artery 
and so even if you are not able to delineate and take the uterine artery at its origin and even if you coagulate instead of there even if you coagulate at this level it is still acceptable because there is hardly any supply of this vessel from this point on and you can safely coagulate it here as well as regards the posterior division of the internal iliac artery it would be good to remember that this is the anterior division of the internal iliac artery which is coming then it is giving out the uterine artery over here and then it is continuing as the obliterated hypogastric the posterior division of the uterine artery has already gone away somewhere over here to supply the posterior part and the gluteus muscle so uh, unless you ligate the uterine artery at a very very uh, unless you ligate the internal iliac artery at a very very high point something like this area or even below that only then it is possible that you will ligate the posterior division as well but the main trunk of the vessel is so short that it is very difficult to ligate the posterior division and very difficult to find it also so you can see that this is the uh, anatomy which is now clear and now I'm going to pass the suture below the uterine artery just a little bit more of dissection to uh, skeletonize the uterine artery if you can call it that and then the suture is going to be passed so what I want to do is I want to have a good stump of the uterine artery or rather a good length of the uterine artery so that my uh, bipolar is able to go underneath it do not try to force anything at this stage be sure to make the window very clearly and with the instrument just poke it gently and then draw the suture alongside so i am i have held this and i am going to put the suture now inside i think i already passed that yes i just forward it a little bit too much yeah so i am catching the suture with the vessel uh, with the bipolar grasper and now i am pulling the suture through once the suture has been passed the majority of the difficult part of the surgery is over and like i said i don't know whether i will be able to take the uterine artery close to the body of the uterus in this particular case and that is the reason why i am performing uterine artery ligation at the origin on the right hand side now here two needle holders come in and since this patient is going for a laparoscopic hysterectomy we can place a permanent knot in this area we don't really need to place a shoelace knot for those of you who do not know a shoelace knot is something uh, that i published and it is now accepted worldwide and practiced by several surgeons you can find the video on the same youtube channel if you google for shoelace knot and there is another modification of the shoelace knot called the trick knot which has also been published both publications in the journal of minimally invasive gynecology so you can see the beautiful tortuosity of the uterine artery now and the ligature which is going and going to comfortably sit on the uterine artery in order to block the uterine artery completely so i like i said if you are able to do this dissection then ligation of the uterine artery i find it to be best because there is no question of any current transmitting to the ureter which is the only structure which can be actually damaged at that level but if you cannot do that and you are planning to coagulate the uterine artery then you can simply safeguard the ureter with one instrument and do a coagulation that is also fine so you can see over here that the uh, the suture has got placed very comfortably over the vessel i'm going to take one more stitch and this occludes the uterine artery completely like i told you before you do not need to cut the uterine artery at any point of time you can you may cut it if you wish but it is really not required and simply putting in a suture and ligating the uterine artery is also sufficient for this particular purpose so this is the uterine artery which has been ligated on the right side on the left side i do not need to do anything similar because the approach seems to be quite easy and now i'm sure that even if i cannot reach up to the uterine artery on the right side there is not going to be any torrential bleeding and i will be able to manage the the case uh, with or without enucleation of the myoma so I think that's it for this uh, particular video of uterine artery ligation. Remember that it is a selective surgery and by no means if you cannot perform uterine artery ligation at origin, should you not do laparoscopic hysterectomy, it is an essential skill to know, but definitely uh, not criminal if you are not aware or if you are not able to do retroperitoneal dissection, you can still do safe laparoscopic hysterectomy in most of the cases.
so i think that's it for this video if you like the video uh, please click on the subscribe button to subscribe to our channel and to keep receiving more updates and do join us uh, on endogynetraining.com to keep receiving more such updates thank you for your patience and for listening